our Advent liturgy for today, the second Sunday in Advent. Our Advent journey calls us on in preparation for what's to come. Our dusting off and getting ready, breaking and changing what we do. Advent God. Because we've always done it, doesn't mean we, we always must, as our journey makes us think again and change the way we live. Advent God. The challenge is to learn what old ways should be no more, to encounter and experience and be brave in stepping out. Advent God. The more we learn, the more we change. The more we think, the more we grow. The more we dust off our old ways, the more our faith shines out. Advent God. Advent God, as we light this second candle, may we accept the challenges and changes to our living and our loving, that your extraordinary gift leads us on all to make. May we be prepared to dust off old ways, learn new ways, and become more Christ-like. Amen. Amen. It's lovely to be with you this morning during this second Sunday of Advent and particularly lovely to have Robert opening our service today. Some of you won't know but I've known Robert since he was about nine or ten and the first time I preached here he actually helped me with the service then. <laughs> Except he wouldn't go back if I remember. <laughs> but it's lovely to see you Robert and to see what a lovely young man you've grown into. We're going to sit, begin our service or continue our service with the hymn 264, Make Way, Make Way.
let us come together in our prayers. Rejoice in the Lord always. Shout out his name, for God is with us, the God of our salvation in whom alone we trust. Rejoice in the Lord always. For your word which endures and for your promises to which we hold, we give you thanks. For the love which from our birth over and around us lies, we give you thanks. For those gathered here today, for family, friend and stranger, we give you thanks. For those who minister your grace, for the hope that lives each advent of a love that has no end, we give you thanks. To you, O Lord, we bring our lives, all that we are and all that we have. Sometimes our hearts and minds are troubled and there are days when they seem endless and we don't know what to do. There are other times when we have great joy in all the things that challenge us. Sometimes we want to be so much more, but use each of us, Lord, according to our ability and our strength. Take away our selfishness and to teach us to love as you loved. Take away our sense of pride and show us the meaning of humility. Take away our blindness and our greed and show us the world through your eyes. As the streets fill with shoppers and bright lights and tempting offers, Christmas songs and children's laughter, you lead us along a different path to a desert river and a prophetic voice, a call to repentance, a call to service, a call to immerse ourselves in living water that will never run dry, a call to prepare a way in our own lives for the saviour of the world to enter to know the touch of tender mercy and rest in your forgiving love. For your faithful prophets and your living word, we give you thanks, Lord. So let us rejoice in the Lord our God as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is that very familiar one from Isaiah chapter 40. And I invite you all to join with the words on the screen. I think it's obvious um, who says what. Isaiah 40, 1 to 11. Comfort my people, says our God. voice cries out, prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord, clear the way in the desert for our God, fill every valley, level every mountain, the hills will become a plain and the rough country will be made smooth, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind will see it. The Lord himself has promised this. A voice cried out, the message. 
What message shall I proclaim? Yes, grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Jerusalem, go up on a high mountain and proclaim the good news. Call out with a loud voice. Zion, announce the good news. Speak out and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah that their God is coming. He will take care of his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs together and carry them in his arms. He will gently lead their mothers. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is the bit in the service when I normally talk to uh, the young people and all those that are under 80. But um, I think they're busy rehearsing. But as we've got quite a number of people under 80, usually if I say I'm not going to do it, they all go, oh, so I'm going to do it. Now, I guess that you've all got an advent calendar at home, have you? Who's got an advent calendar? Oh, there's a few people. I'd like, and Robert's got one, good. I'd like to say that I've got one, but I haven't. But aren't they filled with all sorts of things? Robert, what's in your advent calendar? Is it edible? Oh, you see, two of them missing as soon as I start. <laughs> Something I've said? Chocolate? Is it? Yes. Right, it's chocolate. Has anybody got expensive perfume? There's even one with Lego in. Have you seen that one? There's all sorts of things. Well, I've got an advent calendar in my head. And it consists of lots of cleaning stuff, lots of lists, Lots of food, lots of cards, and lots of decorations. And lo and behold, on day 10, which is the advent calendar day, I have brought what was in my advent calendar. And it's my faithful feather duster. <laughs> now, the idea was that the children would go around and find any dirt that happened to be hanging about in the corners of the room. But I'll not try it, I don't think, so I don't think it will quite reach. But my advent calendar, this is very important for my advent calendar, because I don't put my tree up until I've cleaned all the corners out. Because you know what happens, don't you? Them spiders come down and drop on you. So it's great fun. It wasn't when I had the grandchildren with me, because it does go further, and um, it used to get into a bit of a problem. But I thought it was very appropriate today, because that advent liturgy said dust yourself off and it's very important that we do that for during advent because we tend to get caught up in all the things that are in our advent calendar and on our lists that we forget to prepare our hearts and mind for Jesus so as you prepare in your home for the visit you know what that's like don't you you bring stuff out of the loft you put stuff back up the loft the more mess than you started with just remember to stop for a minute and dust yourself off Oh, round of applause. We're going to continue um, singing together with our hymn 167, Colours of Day.
now have our Gospel reading from Mark. Reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the, ne- the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. We sing together hymn 182 on Jordan's Bank. long time ago, more than I care to remember, I went to visit my family in Bradford, my brother and his young children, and we went to their local church on this particular Sunday. 
And as the steward welcomed everybody like Margaret did this morning, suddenly someone burst through the rear doors at the back, shouting, prepare the way for the Lord. He was wearing a bear skin, long tunic type trousers, a very wild looking wig on his head. He carried a large stick, waving a bag of food around, which much to the children's delight, he said, contained locusts and other heavenly insects. Well, you can imagine, because nobody in the congregation knew what was happening. And of course, it turned out to be the preacher for the morning. Well, I did think about it. <laughs> I did think about it, but I couldn't find a wig wild enough. But we tend to expect certain things to happen, don't we, at this time of the year? And you can imagine the steward's face, um, all the, the other people, actually the steward did know what was happening, because she'd have been more panicking if there was no preacher. Um, and a wild preacher rushing in the service in the middle of Advent was not one of them. But it did make me think, and all these years later, I still remember the impact that it had on me, and certainly on my niece and nephew and the other children present. They couldn't stop talking about it. Well, in Advent, we sort of rush in, don't we, to the countdown to Christmas, day 10 on the calendar. We have the picture of Christmas Day and the nativity in our heads, and we rush to put the pieces together. Now, I wonder if you have a favorite Christmas movie. When my grandchildren were younger, I really did not want to watch Nativity 1 and Nativity 2 again. I knew all the songs, I could recite the scenes, but in some ways it was strangely reassuring as well because there were no nasty surprises or shocks. It was, if you like, one of the pieces of the jigsaw of events that makes up Christmas. And of course other things include the food, the relatives, the carols, the nativity play, the holly, and all the various rituals and traditions. And the Christmas story itself is something of a jigsaw, where the pieces include images of stars and angels, mangers, kings and shepherds. And if you go to a school nativity these days, it usually consists of a lot of other people as well. Because of course if you've got 30 in your class, you have to actually make up who's going to play what. So many bits and pieces that make up Christmas. So it can be a bit disconcerting when we bump into this gospel reading with this wild man baptising people in the desert because it doesn't fit into our Christmas jigsaw. And does it even belong in our Christmas countdown? And as we heard read to us, Mark doesn't start the gospel with Jesus' birth. He, tells, he doesn't tell us anything about nativity plays. He tells us that this story is of Jesus, is about the whole of creation standing on the brink of a total and radical transformation, a new beginning with God through the transforming presence of Jesus. Mark's not really interested in the life story. He's not concerned about the parentage or the method of conception of John the Baptist or Jesus. He's more concerned with the message of the good news that God is once again bringing his people out of slavery into the promised land. And the first words we read in Mark's Gospel, this is the beginning of good news about Jesus the Messiah. But who is this man? I guess John the Baptist was seen as an oddity, an eccentric, but he certainly had a kind of attraction now, if he appeared out in the Peak District and you'd heard about him, I wonder how many of you would go and look for him and listen to him, because we want to know who people are talking about. So he was very popular. Now, that might have been despite or because of his somewhat wild appearance rather than his stirring words. Many would just go to see what he looked like. All would be wanting to hear about freedom from their rulers harsh taxation systems that bled the poorest and the weakest. Freedom from the tyranny of the ruling rich. They were living in their so-called promised land, but they didn't feel free. And that happens now, doesn't it? And it happens when great speakers crowd round and people get stirred up by what they're saying. It happens a lot on social media. 
It gets people thinking and talking, but sadly, not always in a positive way. And it's so much easier, isn't it, to say what you think on social media than face people face to face. John the Baptist told the people to repent and start living the way that God wanted them to. He told tax collectors to stop cheating. He told soldiers to stop blaming the people when things went wrong. So people flocked to him and he spoke with authority, but not of his own. His ministry was to prepare people for someone much greater. And he would always remind them of this if they tried to make him the focus or push him into the limelight. John knew he was the forerunner of someone greater who was yet to come. The trouble was that that morning service in Bradford all those years ago, people were not prepared. I mean, didn't this preacher know that the whole point of Advent is about angels and shepherds and presents and bright lights and goodwill to all? Because unfortunately, that is what people expected. And in fact, that's what we expect in December. And maybe that's what we expect as well in our day. This wild man, of course, was just a warm-up act before the real star appeared. But of course, the people of Israel living in exile and captivity and oppressed on all sides were ready for revenge. And all they needed was someone who would cry out for and on behalf of them. And you stop for a moment and you think about the Holy Land and the situation there. It's so similar to all those years ago. They saw it as payback time and here was just the man giving the people a message of hope, inciting the people to challenge the system, but to do so with justice. John had a very specific job description. He was to be a witness to the light that was coming into the world. He was to be a witness to his cousin Jesus, the Son of God. But wouldn't you like to know if they ever had a conversation together about their roles? I'm sure the two mums did, Elizabeth and Mary. They would have talked and shared their own thoughts. But I wonder about the two boys. We know that John was probably a member or rather influenced by a group of scholars called Essence, a sect that existed then in Palestine. And they were devoted to celibacy and piety and study and charitable acts. And they certainly didn't have a love of money or possessions. They were in the same traditions of prophets like Isaiah and Amos and Hosea. They were people who shouted out, they thought injustice. They preached good news to the poor, bringing some light and hope into people's lives and often faced death because of it. But then we don't come across John the Baptist again in our readings till the beginning of Lent as he points his disciples towards Jesus. And surely at that point, John the Baptist would know that Jesus is the promised one, the Son of God. But maybe... Jesus did not even meet John's expectations. Like many of us, we do not expect to encounter the Son of God on the riverbank or outside the temple or in the desert, but rather in a more sacred space. Maybe we also do not expect Jesus or his voice in some of the places or situations we find ourselves in or the times we watch the world destroying itself through wars, conflicts, hunger, death and misery, or as we listen and watch to how the world is fast being destroyed, or how we're destroying the planet through rapid speed of climate change. Where are the John the Baptist of our world as we know it? And we ask ourselves, where is the Son of God? On the day that the hostages were first taken in Israel, I was at a dinner in Ada, Palestine, supported and run by the <coughs> refugees here in Chesterfield. And as we were eating, they were receiving text messages of what was happening to their family and friends. It affected me profoundly, and it's affected the way in which I preach over the next, or, or recently over the last few weeks. It's very hard, isn't it? 
to preach the gospel of the coming of the Son of God when he comes to a world that is so fractured. But I do believe that he is there. Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says Isaiah. But the word comfort seems a rather very soft, lovely approach. But here the word comfort comes from the Latin meaning with strength. And then it makes more sense. Here is a positive willingness to get right to the heart of things and being fully immersed in the pain and sorrow of the sufferer. So God, through his prophet, is not offering his people a quick fix for their pain and distress or a throwaway comment which he does not really mean. He is expressing all they needed to hear then and what we need to hear now, that their God, our God, has stood and is stood with them and with us now in our present age, with strength, with purpose, with absolute total commitment. Here is a pointer to the promise of the incarnation. Here is the expectation of the cry of John the Baptist, the absolute truth that God will come and stand in the midst of our humanity. He will not fail us, no matter our trauma or our distress. The ultimate fulfilment of the prophet's role comes not in the return of the Israelites from Babylon, but in the life of Jesus. And they are fulfilled in the life of the one who walked in the power of the God of love. Vengeance is left with God. And the human task becomes instead the bringing of the good news to the poor. A great saviour indeed, but not the warrior saviour savior that was expected. But who are the prophets? The John the Baptist of our times. He stood out from his contemporaries in how we lived. Who could we in our day compare to John the Baptist? Or has the church abdicated this role to the popular press, the astrologers, the influencers on social media, famous personality, our politicians? And who are the collective voices sent by God to speak to our community and society? And in so doing, do we ignore the weaker, more silent voices of the less powerful and yet the most vulnerable? But we all can be John the Baptist if we want to be. We may not be great proclaimers, but we can each still bring light and hope into a world which has so much darkness. Where so many are suffering in our own country, with not just poverty, but work poverty, People who either because their wages are so low or because travelling and childcare costs are so high struggle to manage their living expenses. Where those who have no home, those who fear Christmas because of loneliness, those who are facing eviction, those who have so many bad memories of Christmas. Where we also know that only strong immediate action will save our planet from the more from irreparable harm. So it's right that we want our governments to act decisively, but perhaps we're not very happy about the cost of it all. Where we want peace and righteousness, prosperity and responsible action, but the paths to each seem to lead in a different direction and cause some to be winners, others losers, and leave thousands dead. Each week, usually in our prayers of intercession, all of these issues are remembered, are prayed for, and we rejoice when we see a flicker of light shining in the darkness. I'm currently reading or studying a, a, an Advent reflection book, which was written before all the troubles in, in the Holy Land. It was written actually two years ago. And it's about the stories of the people in both Israel and Palestine and Gaza and their stories, and the immense stories of people working together in peace, Jews, Muslims, Christians. And they were just getting to a point where they thought that there was some opportunity of a lasting peace. But how does all this then help us in our daily living, our daily discipleship of faith? John was in the right location at the right time. But who would have guessed that John would work through the wilderness rather than the temple? God's agenda often looks on paper unlikely to succeed, 
for it does and with astonishing results. God works in unexpected places with unexpected people. And sometimes, probably like me, you watch the news and everything can seem too much, too much darkness, too much need, that we're in danger of doing nothing with our prayers. Prepare, make straight is what the gospel writer says. So what actions can we take that might make a lasting difference to ourselves and others? Are our Christmas preparations during Advent reflecting a deeper preparation for the kingdom that Christ brings? Like I said, we do have to be great. We don't have to be great proclaimers, though we desperately need them. But we can speak out where there is injustice. We can bring some comfort and healing to people in need. We can be a listening ear and we can pray. And we can fight for justice. No one in that church in Bradford expected John the Baptist that morning. And because we've become so familiar with the story of Christmas, we can so easily forget its huge significance. You see, we can choose to just ignore the message, dismiss it, dismiss it as irrelevant for this age. We can decide to postpone doing anything about it right now and do things in our own time scale. Or we can grasp this opportunity of mission and be ready for the next stage. God's call is not once and for all, but again and again. He calls his people now to be ready at every stage of our journey of faith, to be responsive to Christ's coming, and to do something about it in the knowledge and the comfort, that strong comfort, that God's purpose will be accomplished in the most unexpected ways. Whilst Advent is a time of preparation, it's a timely reminder of God's patience with us and of his purpose. It's not a time to sit back and do nothing. It's a time to reassess our own relationship with God, not to take this life or God's love for granted, but to live the kind of life that would be pleasing to him. It's a time of opportunity when the world is actually at least thinking in a small way about the coming of Jesus through nativity, through Christmas carol services, which talk of the birth of Christ. And this Christmas will be so hard in so many different ways, not least of all as the Holy Land wages war around the very place where Jesus came into the world. It was in torment and turmoil and hatred then, with savage, horrific crimes committed. So much so that early on, Jesus was a refugee and had to flee. When he comes again as a baby this Christmas, there'll be nowhere for him to flee. Instead, he'll be born into a broken and a desperate land where there'll not even be a stable or a manger, but only rubble. Warfare, hunger and violence as the military on both sides fight for what they believe to be their land as once more Jesus comes to those who are oppressed. Bethlehem will not lie still this Christmas, and the angels will not be heard, but Jesus will be there, just as he is in all our lives, no matter how we might feel, no matter how much despair we might feel. All we need to do is open our hearts and minds and allow him to enter once more into our lives. Amen. As we come to our prayers, I invite you to remain seated and we're going to use the hymn 183 Praise to the God who clears the way as part of our prayers. There'll be some silences, some responses, and Peter then will play another verse of the hymn. So thank you, Peter.
Today, Sunday, December the 10th, is also Human Rights Day. And we remember those in the land called Holy, and in many lands, who yearn to return home from war and threat of violence. Those who are internally displaced, or sojourners in a strange land. Some living in tents and crowded refugee camps, not just for months, not just for years, but for decades. For the people in Gaza, with nowhere to go, as they seek safety. We pray for those in war-torn countries, in Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia, and many other lands, who are sinking deeper into despair, where lives are fractured, bodies hungry and damaged, infrastructure and homes destroyed. In a world of turmoil and instability, our God is steadfast and reliable. And we pray for all those across the world who have never glimpsed that truth, who have never had a life-changing experience of Jesus Christ, who have never heard what Advent and Christmas are really all about. Eternal God, as we pray for your people, may we become messengers of your word. pray for those who fear the cost of Christmas and the debts that will likely incur, who dread the family arguments that often ensue. Amidst the tinsel and the fairy lights and the commercial trappings, may they and we discover the message of this season. May your word ring out loud and clear with the promise of your good news and what is to come. May the significance of a babe born in an oppressed country touch their lives. May they find in you love, peace and hope for the future. We pray for those who bear the burden of illness and pain physical or mental. For those who cannot get the treatment they need, whose pain gets deeper and darker each passing day. In the silence, Lord, we bring them to you. For those stuck in hospital because there's no safe and caring place for them to move to. For those who near the end of life are fearful, especially those without family and friends to support them. I'd ask you to think of a lady called Shirley who came to one of our warm spaces and has continued to come, who is very ill, who has little in the way of family, but doesn't want to accept help either. There are many, O oh Lord, like her, and we bring them now to you. Eternal God, as we pray for your people, 
may we become messengers of your word. pray for the lonely as others around them prepare for Christmas, for those whose families are far away and those whose families do not care. May they find a friendly smile, a cheery welcome, a word of comfort and hope for the future in unexpected places. As we prepare for this most holy time, May we put together the pieces of our lives that make us who we are and step into each new day, hopeful of your promises that are to come. May we know your love and find peace and joy and hope. Eternal God, these are the prayers we offer. We are your people and we offer ourselves to you that we may indeed become messengers of your word. O oh Lord our God, as we brought ourselves to worship this morning, we bring our lives, our minds, our hearts, our money, our possessions, that all may be used to you for your good and to further the light of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. It's been a pleasure to worship with you this morning and I did mean to say how beautiful the church looks. I don't know who's done all these beautiful decorations but doesn't it look so lovely and so just so so peaceful. So thank you. We close our worship by singing together 185. Sing we of the King who is coming to reign.
the wilderness, as we go out into the world, may we hear the cries for change and listen for the call of your Holy Spirit. And may God be with each one of us, bringing peace and love into our hearts this Advent time. Amen. Amen.